Welcome, Appleton Community Evangelical Free Church, Sunday morning worship, and we uh, are appreciative of all that are participating, all that watch. Uh, some come to our service and also watch this, I know that. Um, I'm trusting that uh, this is something that is helpful, and uh, we are starting, uh, have had three messages that have led into this, uh, to, to talk about and to focus in on what it is that our church believes. And um, we, we are an evangelical free church. You, many of you, if not all of you, are aware of that. And we abide by one of the doctrinal statements that the free church uh, used. The current one we have not adopted just yet. It's not that it's bad, it's just that we like the one uh, that um, is previous and um, we, we hold to some things that are in that doctrinal statement that are less focused in the new doctrinal statement and uh, like I say it's not that it's bad it's not that there's something wrong uh, it's just that we like the, the, the doctrinal statement that's a little more specific so that's that and as I uh, get started today, I'm going to pray, like I always do. And then uh, we're going to open God's Word and consider what uh, we can learn about God and His, His, His uh, character, His nature. And uh, actually, the first, uh, the first of the doctrinal statements in the doctrinal statement is about the doctrine of God, God Almighty. And I'll read that here in a little bit. And uh, like I say, I want to pray. So bow with me if you would. Pray along with me and, and, and ask that God will use the time we share together as we look into his word. So please, Father, I thank you for the, po the, 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 I thank you for the, uh, the presence that you provide for us. The fact that you said you'd never leave us nor forsake us. You're with us always. You love us with love that's beyond anything we can ever imagine. We don't completely understand or grasp the greatness of your love, the, un, un, um, the uncompromising nature of it, the unconditional nature of it, the uh, fact that it is fully filled with grace, it is fully fill, filled with mercy, it does things that we as human beings cannot do without your help and without your presence in our lives. And I praise you for that. Praise you for the presence you give us, Father. I ask that you'd use what we do today as we look into your word and consider uh, who you are and what you've provided for us. Uh, I, I pray that you'll help us to see these things in a clear fashion. Help us to understand what Paul said when he spoke to those people in Athens 2,000 years ago. Help us to be able to focus in on the truths that determine and develop our understanding of you, Father, and who you are, what you mean, uh, what you mean to us, what you've provided in the sense that you're the creator, the almighty creator. Help us to see that. Help us to know that. I pray, Father, that you would use not only this message, but use the ministries of our church in a very special fashion. Here in a little while tonight, I'm, I'm recording early, a little while tonight, uh, the church is going to be filled with Awana kids, and we're thankful for that. That's a great ministry. We're thankful for the women's Bible studies, the men's discipleship group, the men's Bible study, uh, youth group, Pastor Blake and all his volunteers, for Lisa and what she does with the children Sunday after Sunday and the various activities she plans, the things she does as she teaches those kids. Thank you, Father. I pray that you would use our church ministry to have an impact on our people, but also on people that surround us. And I pray, Father, that today as we look into your, the doctrine that describes you, the teaching about you, that you'll help us to understand more and more about you, that we might gain a greater grasp of knowing you and loving you. Help us in that, Father. Help me to be able to communicate clearly. Help me to be able to express things in a fashion that, uh, uh, that is clear and um, that it explains things so comprehensively, Father, 
that uh, your Holy Spirit will be able to grab hold of it and help us to see things in a clear fashion, in a good fashion. We love you. We thank you. I just pray your blessing over this time, Father, and I ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. All right. The Free Church, the Evangelical Free Church, we have a 10-point doctrinal statement. We're going to go through all 10 points, but we're not going to go through them one by one because we're going to look at them in a fashion that allows us to not only see an academic study, so to speak, of, well, this is what we believe. No, that's, that's not what I want to do. I want us to understand why we believe what we believe and how it affects our lives. I think that's so important. And therefore, the first statement in the doctrinal statement, and we're going to take two to three weeks on this. I'm planning on three right now, but I'll see how next week's message develops. But uh, it states that we believe in one God, creator of all things, holy, infinitely perfect, and eternally existing in a loving unity of three equally divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Having limitless knowledge and sovereign power, God has graciously purposed from eternity to redeem a people for himself, and to make all things new for his own glory. Now, that's a great statement. It is. But what I want us to see today is the importance of understanding that we worship one God. The central idea that I'm focusing in on in this message right now, right here, I'm putting it up on the screen. We worship one God who has created all things and has revealed himself to all people everywhere. We worship one God. He exists in three persons. We saw that in the statement. We'll look at that some today, but more next week. And he has created all things. Father, Son, Holy Spirit were involved in creation. Genesis 1, Genesis 2. And God has revealed himself to people everywhere. And we have to recognize he's revealed himself. It says in Romans 1 that everyone has a sense of God's existence. Even the atheist has a sense of God's existence. And we worship one God. That's the statement we see. Now, as I say that, I want to introduce this today and just ask, do you ever stop and ask yourself, do I have idols? You know, we see in the, in the Bible, we're going to look in this passage I'm studying today, Acts 17, the whole idea of many idols in Athens. We read in the Bible of things that happened with the, the, the idols of Baal, the other idols of the Hittites and the uh, Jebusites and all these other individuals that were in, in the scriptures, the Amorites and, and uh, the Babylonians. When, when Daniel was in Babylon, we studied that some weeks ago. We see all that idolatry and say, well, you know, we don't do that stuff. But you know what? Then we need to ask ourselves, do I truly only worship one God? Now, when it comes to my sense of faith, my focus on Jesus Christ, yes, it's clear. Each of us would say, yes, I worship one God. But when we look at life in general... Are there things that we idolize? Are there people that we idolize? Are there desires that we have that become so prominent that they are insatiable? We cannot satisfy what we, how we much we desire that. Is that something that happens? I, I've said before many times that growing up, I grew up in a strong, solid Christian family, a, a good church. And I, I, I understand all of that. But yet, sports was an idol for me. I'm sure there were various other things that became idols for me. And I can say today, I have to check myself occasionally to say, okay, is my focus where it ought to be? Am I drawing a devotion to things that would make it into an idol, make those things into idols? We need to ask ourselves that because we worship one God, one God who created all things, things that we enjoy, things that are for our benefit, 
things that we sometimes might take and idolize. Must be careful. And God has revealed himself to people everywhere. Everyone has an understanding, in, innate, an innate understanding that God exists. Some people deny it. Some people push it aside. Some people allow the, allow the idol worship that they have to make them express the idea they have an atheistic faith and that they don't believe in a supreme being, but they believe in other things that they very much show devotion, they show dependence on these types of things. But we're looking at Acts chapter 17, not the whole chapter. The whole chapter is an interesting section because it first talks about Paul going to Thessalonica, talks about Paul going to Berea, the Bereans, the ones that examined the scriptures daily. And then we see where Paul landed in Athens. He went to Athens, Greece. And he was in Athens, Greece, waiting for Timothy and Silas to come and meet him. They become separated. Some things had happened along the way, and they become separated. We won't get into all those details. It's an interesting story, but that's not really where we're focusing our attention today. But we realize that, that uh, uh, Paul was there in Athens, and as we read this section, we see that now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, the others left. So Paul's by himself in Athens. He doesn't indicate that he knew anybody there. It doesn't indicate that he had any particular purpose in being there other than waiting for Tim, Timothy and Silas. And yet what we see, I want some, we'll give some aspects of Athens. Aspects of Athens. Athens was a city... Population around 10,000 people. 10,000 people. There were three gods in Athens for every one person. Their idol population was over 30,000. Over 30,000 idols. Paul addresses them and said, I see you are a city filled with idols, he says. So we also see in this passage, there's a main attraction a main attraction, that is an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Just think they had 30,000 idols, 30,000 gods, and yet they also recognized this, this altar that was dedicated to an unknown God, just in case, just in case. And as Paul had some idle time waiting for Timothy and Silas to arrive, he went out and, and, and explored the city. Follow as I read the first few verses of what we're looking at today. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city filled with idols. So he was reasoning, to the, reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? What do you, you idle babbler, what do you want to say? And others, well, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. Areopagus. That's not easy for me to pronounce. Uh, if I could see it in the Greek language, maybe I'd be able to say it better, but I see it in English and they transliterate it and it's hard. The Areopagus. Areopagus saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, and we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spe spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. They loved novel and new ideas. They focused on that. They spent their time doing that. We're going to stop reading there because we see first... 
first thing we see, we saw this in verse 16, Paul's problem. <clears throat> he had a problem. It says his spirit within him was being provoked while he was observing this city filled with idols. His spirit within him, God's Holy Spirit was provoked when he looked and saw all these idols around him. Paul had a problem with that. He struggled in saying, look at all these idols. They don't know the God of the universe. They don't know the creator of the universe. They don't know the God that I worship that met me on the road to Damascus. And Paul is expressing this and recognizing there's a problem and his spirit was provoked. And I'm going to say later as I close this message off, if we are confronted with idolatry, our spirit should be provoked. We should be troubled. I can tell you there are times when I've walked past certain places and I can get an eerie feeling and I don't think that's just something I ate for dinner that, that's upsetting my stomach. Really, that eerie feeling is that sense of there's idolatry around. Sometimes there is spiritual worship because of idolatry. Sometimes there's a sense of attraction to things. I'm one that I'm going to say right now. I know some people won't agree with me on this. I don't think that yoga is safe. I don't think we should do yoga exercises. I think that's a dangerous thing to do. Why? Because it's coupled with idolatry. Stretching exercises, fine. But yoga, uh-uh. I don't think it's, it's healthy. I don't think it's safe. There's an idolatry that is coupled with that. And idolatry is something that should provoke us. We should realize, hey, something's not right here. So we see that first. But secondly, we have to understand Paul's pattern. Paul's pattern. It says, so he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. I'll put that up on the, on the screen. Paul's pattern, everywhere he went, he went to the synagogue and would talk to people about faith. The faith of the Jews, the faith of the Jews toward the Messiah. And he would point to Jesus. And Paul followed his pattern as he went to, to Athens. But yet, he was provoked by the idolatry there. He was provoked by that. And as he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, he also recognized, I need to go out to the marketplace and talk to people there. And he did. And he talked with anybody that happened to be present. And I'm just going to point out for us, as we look at that, we who worship one God who created everything and has revealed himself to all people, Romans 1, everyone has a sense of God's presence, a sense that God exists. Everyone has that. They may deny it. They say, may suppress that feeling, but everyone has it. And Paul went out into the marketplace. We also should go out to the marketplace. We should develop a pattern that says, I'm going to look for opportunities to share Jesus Christ with people. I worship one God. I worship him. He's in, the, in, in, in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He created everything. He's the God of this universe. He's the Lord Almighty. And we should recognize that there are opportunities available for us to tell others about our faith in one God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We should develop a pattern for ourselves. But thirdly, Paul's personal ministry to the philosophers. We find in verses 18 through 21 here, I read it earlier, some of the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers were talking with Paul. Some were saying, well, what are you going to say to us, you idle babbler? Others are saying to him, well, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the, to the Are, Areopagus, Are, Areopagus, Areopagus, hard to say. You try saying it three times real fast. And it says, may we know what this new teaching is that you're proclaiming. These people that were always searching for something new. 
they recognized Paul was different. Paul had a different philosophy than they did. But they said, hey, tell us about what you believe. And Paul's personal ministry to the philosophers. And, you know, it says they brought him to the, the city center, the place where Mars Hill, where Paul was going to preach a message that we're going to look at right now here in a couple moments. And, and his ministry to the philosophers, he spoke with them. He challenged them. He made them think about what they believed. And I think we can learn from that too. It says basically, I'll, I'll show on, on the screen, it says in some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. And they were saying, you know, what would this idle babbler say? What do you have to say? What do you have to teach us? And what do I have on the card? It says, it says, hey, may we know, they brought him to the Areopagus and say, may we know what this new teaching is, which you're trying to tell people. We want to know what do these things mean? And you know what? I believe very clearly that when we present our faith to others, there are going to be some people that are going to say, hey, you're just an idle babbler. But there are going to be some people that are going to say to us, tell me about it. And then we need to talk about our faith in one God who created all things, who's revealed himself to all people everywhere, and he is calling people, men and women, boys and girls, he's calling on people to repent of their unbelief and trust in him, recognize him. But what we find in this passage is Paul's proclamation. Number four, Paul's proclamation. Verses 17 through, uh, verses 21 through 31. Chapter 17, verses 21 through 31. Paul's proclamation. Follow as I read the passage, and then we're going to look at this in four different sections, four different pieces, and then we're going to draw some applications of how this relates to our lives and how this relates to the idea that we as a free church believe, we believe in one God creator of all things. He's revealed himself to people everywhere. And he's working to draw men and women to the point of repentance of their unbelief and following after him. We recognize that. But now we look at this section here. You know, they, they brought Paul to the city center, the Areopagus. And it says, So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. You're very religious. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, get that word, what you worship in ignorance, I'm going to proclaim this to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with human hands nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything or is dependent upon them since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things paul's describing god almighty the creator god and he made from one man every nation of mankind adam in the garden of eden he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their inhabitation. God created it all. He has a time frame. He has a plan for the ages. God has everything under control. Yes, things get messy sometimes. The sin of the world, which God allowed to take place, it gets messy, but God still has a plan. He has a purpose. It says, God has revealed himself that they would seek him if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Paul's speaking to the men there in Athens. For in him we live and move and exist. As even some of your own poets have said, we are also his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed in, the, in art or the thought of man, 
because that's not God. It's not formed in the thought of man. Having been, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, the God I'm speaking about here, Paul could have said that, the God he is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent of their unbelief. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. We know that's Jesus Christ. Four things that I want to point out, and then five applications. Number one is we recognize we worship, we believe in one God. As we see this, Paul says to the men in, in, in Athens, I've observed your idols and I've seen your altar dedicated to an unknown God. I've seen this. I've recognized this. And he's pointing out to them that idolatry is an indication that something is missing or something is misguided. Idolatry is an indication that something is either missing or misguided. What do I mean by that? You know, when people worship idols, what are they doing? They're accumulating for themselves something that gives them a sense of security. Gives them a sense of of confidence. It gives them a sense of dependence. It gives them that sense of, okay, it fills my life. When I was a young man, even today, I enjoy sports. I want, I don't want to idolize it. When I was a young man, there were many times when the sporting events that I, I either, I participated in those things or other, those things sometimes filled my life. They, they were the thing that was at the centerpiece of my life in a certain way. Now, I was in a good Christian home, and I, I recognized Sunday after Sunday, week after week, Wednesday nights, we were in Bible class every Wednesday night. And, you know, I recognized that, and I understood. I, I was learning things the whole time, but yet you fight the battle of idolatry. Why? Idolatry means something's missing or something is misguided. Something's out of place. And Paul is saying that, that I, I notice here, you've got this, this, this uh, altar with the inscription to an unknown God. And that tells me, Paul is saying, there's something that's missing in your life. You don't know the God of the universe. There's something that misguided in your life. You don't understand what he's done. You don't understand his creative powers. You don't understand his creative provisions, how he's provided everything you have. And Paul is saying it's either missing or misguided. But secondly, he's pointing out that a person search for an unknown God. Anybody would search for an unknown God? Just in case. We've got 30,000 idols in this city, the Athens said. We're going to have one more just in case. There's one more out there. And Paul says, hey, that's perfect. That's perfect for my my sermon to them because he's telling them a person's search for an unknown God basically is a result of ignorance what's he say here he says therefore what you worship in ignorance I'm now proclaiming to you so they have this sense of ignorance because they're saying there's something that's missing there's something that we don't know there's something that we just in case. But then secondly, there's that sense of insecurity. Well, maybe we've missed one. Maybe we don't have all the gods in place that we, we need. Ignorance or insecurity. As we consider that, let's look and see, do we sometimes suffer from ignorance in our understanding of God? Or do we suffer from an insecurity in the sense of, well, I need something else. I need something more. I've had calls from people, and they say, you know, answer some questions for me. There's something that isn't right. Something isn't happening that should be happening right now. Something isn't fitting together that should be fitting together right now. Where is God? How come God is missing in my life? People have said that to me. And I point them to scriptural te teaching. I, I look at things in their lives, and I try to help them see, well, God's there, and God's there, and let's recognize what he's doing. And as Paul continues his sermon here, 
The third thing, some of the words on this are going to be harder to see, but the big words are not hard at the top. He points out, God is our creator. The one that made the world is God Almighty. The, Ath the Athenians, the Greeks, the philosophers, the Stoics, the Epicureans, they probably didn't acknowledge that. And basically what Paul is saying here, I'm going to read it, I'm not going to read it, I'm going to read it, I'm not going to put it on screen, uh, I don't know that you can see it, if you're taking notes, please do, hopefully you'll look at the sermon notes that are provided on the online uh, feed that you got, but God is our creator. He made the world and all things in it. Notice what it says here. The God who made the world and all things in it. You're missing him. You're not seeing him. People around us maybe are missing him and not seeing him. Maybe there are days when you're not seeing God yourself. He made the world and all things in it, number one. Number two, or secondly, I should say, he doesn't dwell in anything made by mankind. You know, it's interesting. God, His Holy Spirit, comes in and dwells my life, your life. We're not man-made. We're made, created by God in God's image. And as we consider that, we realize that God Himself does not dwell in anything made by man. Paul says that right here. He says, The God who made the world and all things in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, He does not dwell in temples made with hands. God doesn't dwell in, in those idols and those things that we tend to say, oh, I, I devote myself to that or I worship that. We worship one God, God Almighty, the creator of this world. He made all things. And he doesn't dwell in anything made by mankind. He is greater than that. The third thing here, he's the giver of life and breath. We read on, it says, he is not served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all people life and breath and all things. The breath that I breathe is a gift from God. The life that I live is a gift from God. Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes basically expresses the truth that let's realize that as we fear God and honor him, in the life that he's given us, we find in this life, life is a gift from God. Initial life. I was born as a baby. I've grown up to a human, an adult. That life is a gift from God. But beyond that, there's something greater that's a gift from God. That's new life in Christ is a gift from God. He's the giver of life and the giver of breath. And it says here in this passage, he made one man... He made from, I'm sorry, he made from one man every nation of people on earth. Some people don't understand this. Some people question this. There are many scientists that question this. There are many people that are saying now there are different ways of looking at it. And I'm sorry, the only way I can look at it is the way the Bible says it. From one man, Adam, in the Garden of Eden, he made every nation of people on earth. He started with Eve, Adam's wife. From Adam, he made Eve. And then Adam and Eve, they procreated. And everybody thereafter was God's creation. And that's God Almighty. But he says here that he is Lord of heaven and earth. He has all authority. We spoke last week, Jesus, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So therefore, go out and make disciples. Jesus is one of the three persons in the Trinity. We're going to look at that more next week. But he is Lord of heaven and earth. Let's acknowledge the fact we worship one God who's Lord of heaven and earth. He's in charge. He's established the beginning and the end. We read on and it says... People would seek God and perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of the, uh, the Greek poets would say, we're, we're children of the Creator. So therefore, being children of the Creator, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed 
by art or by the thought of man. God is not something that man thought up. He, it says, he goes on, it says, and having overlooked times of ignorance, he is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through whom he is appointed and having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. And it says in verse 26, I didn't read this, I read it again now, or I read it earlier, but I'll read it now. He says, um, He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. He established the beginning, He established the end. He knows the days of our lives. He knows every day we live. He knows when we start. He knows when our life here on earth is done. But fortunately, through Jesus Christ, as described here, I know that I have a home waiting for me in heaven someday. But the last thing we see in the idea that God is our creator, it says here, he has fixed a day when he will judge the world. He is the judge. He is the judge. And we worship one God who created all things. He revealed himself to every, people everywhere. He exists in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And he will be the judge of all people. And he will judge all of us as to whether we deserve the glories of heaven by trusting in Christ, not by what we've done, but what he's provided us, by our faith, by our belief. He is our creator, and we have to understand that. But the last thing, well, actually, yeah, the last point I want to make here, these four points here of this section, God has revealed himself through one man. Paul says that here. He's revealed himself through one man. This one man who will judge the world in righteousness. Now we look at that. I'm going to put it down for a second. Judges the world in righteousness. We might think, okay, he judges the world in righteousness. Does that mean good and bad? No. In this case, he judges the world in perfect fairness and justice. God's system of justice is perfect. He will judge the world with perfect justice. Basically, there are two types of people in this world. There are people that trust in him and in what he promised to do in sending Jesus Christ. And there are people that reject him and fail to trust in Jesus Christ. He's judge, he judges us based on, do, we, do you trust in my grace, in my goodness, in my provision through Christ? Or are you trying to trust in yourself and in your own belief system? We... The Evangelical Free Church, followers of Jesus Christ, we worship one God. We believe in one God who created all things. And he's revealed himself to people everywhere. And he wants people to repent. So the second thing we see in this, in this point right here, he, God has revealed himself through one man to people everywhere, declaring to people everywhere to repent. Right there. It says, He fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through whom a man whom he appointed, having furnished proof to all men, raising him from the dead. But he says earlier in verse 30, he says, Declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. And in this case, the idea of repentance is to repent of unbelief. Repent of that saying, I don't trust in a creator God. I don't trust in a savior God. I don't trust in a spirit God who comes to, and to, to guide my life. And the people, you know, the, the, it declaring people everywhere to repent of their unbelief. But the final thing it says, and he proved it. He proved it to all people by raising him, Jesus Christ, from the dead. He points to the resurrection. Paul points to the resurrection. And he says, the resurrection proves it all. And as we look at this whole piece today, this whole thing that we're, look, we're considering, I go back to the idea here that I first expressed. We, 
We worship one God. There are many tempting things in the world around us, many idols that tempt our lives, but we focus our attention on one God who has created all things. He's an almighty, all-powerful God, and he has revealed himself. Romans 1, every person has evidence of God in them. God has given evidence of himself in every person. There's no one that can say, hey, I didn't know, because it says essentially every person has been given the revelation of God in themselves. And they stand before God's judgment and say, well, I didn't know. God says, you're without excuse. Look at Romans 1. Read that. But he's revealed himself to people everywhere. And we need to understand that. But now there's, there's, there's five applications that I want to draw here. Some of them are focused in a little bit on idolatry. And when we get to the end, we're going to focus in on the belief system that's necessary. But we need to realize as we learn from what Paul taught here, as we look at, we worship one God. That means we don't worship idols. I go back to Exodus 20. As I look at Exodus 20, I go back there, and it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. We worship one God. We need to be careful about idolatry. And therefore, I'm just going to point out that I think we, anytime we're confronted, anytime we're confronted with a sense of idolatry around us, in our own lives, in our families' lives, in our friends' lives, in the world around us, when, we're, when, we're, when we see these things where idolatry becomes so prominent, we who are followers of Christ should become uneasy. We should become uneasy. We should become uncomfortable. We should say, hey, this, there's something wrong here. And that should prompt us to point to Christ, to point to God, our Creator, to point to our Savior, to point to our Judge and say, look around you. The evidence, the, the heavens declare the glory of God. Look around you. We ourselves should regularly look around ourselves and say, I see the evidence of God, the Creator. Anytime we're confronted by idolatry, there should be a sense of uneasiness or some, we should become uncomfortable. Now, secondly, second application here, our trust, our faith, our belief in God should either make the world around us uncomfortable or inquisitive. Our faith, our trust, our belief in God our focus on one God who created all things, who sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be the Savior of the world. Our faith should make the world either uncomfortable or inquisitive. They should either be uncomfortable around us because they realize there's something missing in their lives. Or they should be inquisitive like the Athenians were with Paul. They question, we want to understand. You teach us something new. We want to understand that. And that's something that we should recognize and understand that our faith, it isn't going to be easily accepted by people around us. It might make them uncomfortable. It could make them inquisitive. But yet that's a good thing. So that's the second application. Thirdly, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. In all creation reveals God in a majestic way. The heavens declare the glory of God, and all creation reveals God in a majestic way. We live in this culture, this, I mean, this, this created world, and it, it's gorgeous. Uh, Donna has a friend. They're on, on vacation right now. They send a picture, and it's just glorious. It's just absolutely beautiful. Uh, 
when, a couple weeks ago, when Don and I were on vacation, we were, were hiking in western Wisconsin, northwestern Wisconsin. We saw scenes and, 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 and views that were just absolutely amazing. The heavens declare the glory of God. All creation reveals God in a majestic fashion. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that thrilling? We should be enthused about the fact that God made this world. Number four, creation and nature, they reveal God. They both reveal God. Creation around us, nature reveals God. But we should be cautious about making them into idols. We should be cautious about making them into idols. I hear so much about science. I hear so much about environmentalism. I believe God created this world. He asks us to be caretakers. He asks us to be those that would take care of this world in the proper fashion. And he wants us to do that. But he doesn't want us to do that in a way that makes it an idol. When I hear certain teachings about climate science or climate change, I'm not going to say that there hasn't been changing climate throughout history. I believe there has been. There was a flood back in Noah's day. There are various things that have happened throughout. Everything is in God's control. And God has given us the beginning and the end in Scripture. And when we start looking at saying, well, okay, this is going to happen or that's going to happen because of what mankind is doing, we're not reading our Bibles. We're making creation and nature into an idol. I think some of the response with regard to the pandemic, some of the response to things that go on around us, it creates an idolatry. Sometimes we look at our government as our God. We need to be careful about that. But the final thing I want us to see today, application-wise, is the philosophers who spoke with Paul. Paul says, "It's I see all, the, all around, you are very religious. The philosophers who spoke with Paul were religious, but religious does not make them righteous. Religion does not make people righteous. Idolatry, misunderstanding the scriptures and twisting God's word, all of these things, they're very religious maybe, but they don't make us righteous. They are not righteous. Whenever God reveals himself, he is calling people to rely on him and to repent from their unbelief. Whenever God is revealing himself, the heavens declare the glories of God. We declare the glories of God. We proclaim the truth of Scripture. Whenever God's message is revealed, he is calling people to rely on him and to repent from their unbelief. Let me show this card. The philosophers that spoke with Paul they were religious. There's a lot of religion around us. There are many, many people that we see on a consistent basis. They're very religious. But religious doesn't make us righteous. Whenever God reveals himself, he is calling people to rely on him. Not on other things, but rely on Him. He's the creator of all things. He gave us all things. We need to see Him as the giver of all gifts. We need to see Him as the giver of life, the giver of breath. We rely on Him. Health and strength, we rely on Him. Yes, there's great medical science. There are many accomplishments that have taken place. But let's recognize God is at the center. When people become gods themselves, there's a problem. But God is consistently revealing himself and he's calling on people to rely on him and to repent from any type of unbelief, any type of idolatry. So I wonder today, what's that saying to you and me? Do I have idol idols in my life? Yes, I'm afraid I do. And I'm going to say very clearly, you do too. 
Everyone watching this does. We all have idols. We all have areas of weakness. When God's word is proclaimed, when God's glory is proclaimed, when God's gospel is proclaimed, he is consistently working through the power of his Holy Spirit to call people to rely on him and to repent from anything that brings about unbelief in their lives. And on a daily basis, we should stop and pause and say, okay, what areas of unbelief are taking hold of my life? What areas of trusting in other things other than God are taking hold of my life? And we should consistently rely on him and repent of all of our unbelief. That's the message. Let me pray as I close. I'll say a few words after I pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are the God of this universe, that you are the creator, that you are the Lord of all nature in all creation. You're the Lord of heaven, the Lord of earth. You've created in such a way, Father, that you are calling men and women to yourself on a constant basis. You're revealing yourself. You're revealing your power. You're revealing your grace, your goodness. Help us who are your children, who are truly your children by faith in Christ. Help us to make a difference in this world by pointing people to the fact that you're calling people, you're calling them to rely on, on him and to repent of their unbelief. And that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And there is no other way, there's no other method by which we can be saved. Father, thank you for that promise. Thank you for that that privilege that we have of being able to trust in you. Help us in that. If there's anyone that's listening, anyone at all, or maybe people that are listening who have family members that don't believe, help us to realize the urgency of getting out there and sharing the good news of Christ. The idea that we worship one God who created all things, who reveals himself to people everywhere and calls himself, call, calls, calls themselves, call, calls the people that he, to whom he reveals himself, calls them to faith in him, to rely and to repent. Father, I pray that. I thank you. I love you. Take care of any special need that's out there. And I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope that if you're watching, that you are encouraged by the fact that we worship one God who created everything. And he has revealed himself to people everywhere. And in that revelation, he is calling on us to rely and to repent. Lord bless. I trust you're doing well. Look forward to seeing you next week. Let's pray for one another. Let's pray for the situation in our country, whether it be the coronavirus or the situations in Afghanistan and otherwise around the world. We need to be praying. Thanks for watching. Lord bless. We'll see you soon.